Hello, everyone. Welcome to session one in the Gift of Life Empowering Living Kidney Donation Series. All lines have been muted. Today's session is being recorded and a copy of the slides, the recording, and the accompanying handout will be available on the Quality Insights Network 5 website. There will be a time at the end for questions. Uh, please submit the questions in the Q&A section below. Our speaker today is Lena Frey. Lena is a nephrology nurse and living kidney donor. She's the co-founder and executive director of Kidney Donor Conversations, a nonprofit organization that provides education and support for living kidney donation. This presentation has been approved for one general continuing education credit for social workers through ASWB. In order to receive these credits, you will need to watch the 60 minute webinar live or recorded, complete the evaluation and post test questions. After that, an official certificate will be emailed to you within three business days. After today's course, learners will be able to describe how to coordinate and conduct appropriate transplant option discussions with dialysis patients. They will be able to differentiate the processes and supports for deceased versus living donor transplantation within the existing transplant system and explain the cost comparisons of dialysis versus transplant. This is the first of four sessions that will take you through the challenges, processes, benefits, and strategies for helping discover living donation. Each session will build upon the prior, so it is helpful to attend all four and to watch the recordings of any sessions you may miss. Session one will discuss the advancements and challenges in accessing kidney transplants. We want to explore the barriers and challenges you may have in the dialysis units and explore ways to better support patients and families. And with that, I will turn it over to Glenda. I was a transplant and dialysis nurse in the 80s and 90s on an inpatient kidney transplant unit where I did uh, besides transplants, CAPD, hemodialysis. And one of my favorite jobs is when I was working with a dialysis social worker, Janisha, providing education to newly diagnosed patients. Years later, I wanted to help someone get off dialysis and live a better life. So I donated my kidney to a stranger in 2017. I'll talk more about that later. The following year, my daughter, Amanda, and I were talking about the lack of information about living donation. And even as a nephrology nurse, I knew very little about the actual process and the options. So we started a nonprofit kidney donor conversations to provide education and support about living kidney donation. And that's really why I'm here today sharing this information with you. If you are in dialysis talking to a patient about kidney transplant, you've already come up against a potential barrier. Um, the best outcomes for those with CKD can be, be provided when education and support starts at stage four, four CKD or before. So this allows time to discuss the best treatment, the plan for a preemptive transplant before dialysis, but it also means that primary care physicians and nephrologists need to start the discussion in their offices before the serious symptoms of kidney failure start. And how often do you think that happens? You may not have control over what happens before, so let's focus on what you do have control of in dialysis. And this is gonna take us to our first polling question. Right. What is your comfort level with discussing kidney transplants? You should see the poll pop up on your screen. We have comfortable, somewhat comfortable, not at all comfortable. And we'll give everyone a few minutes or a couple seconds to answer. Okay. 
So I'm going to just give you a little reminder of something you I'm sure already know about the CMS standard <clears throat> for the frequency of assessment for patients admitted to the dialysis facility. An initial comprehensive assessment must be conducted on all new patients in the latter of 30 calendar days or 13 outpatient hemo sessions, beginning on the first outpatient dialysis session. And now we're gonna go just to those poll results and see what they are. So it looks like most of you are comfortable, but um, there is a small percent that are not. So that's good. This gives us lots of opportunity um, in these next four sessions um, to work on that. So this is the assessment criteria. Um, evaluation of the suitability for transplant referral based on the criteria developed by the transplant center and its surgeons. If the patient's not suitable, then um, this must be documented in the patient's medical record. So do you have the criteria of all the transplant centers you could refer patients to? And in order to figure this out, I guess first you would need to have the patient choose a transplant center and then look at that specific criteria. Um, and you know what? Some of the center criteria may not be black and white. For example, the word compliance could be different for different transplant centers. Um, stop smoking, like is that in the last week or month or year? Uh, drug use could be variable. Um, support systems. So even though there is criteria, I know just from experience that every transplant center also has their own specific policies. And this takes us to polling question number two. Okay. At what point are you initiating discussions with patients about living kidney transplant and donation? Never. It's up to the transplant center. When we bring up transplants with the care plan, when the patient asks, or it is posted in the facility. And so while you guys are doing that poll, I'm going to continue. So if the minimum standard is that transplants discussed within the first 30 days, and then annually if the patient's stable, but what's the best time? Is it day one, day 15, day 30? Um, or maybe it's as soon as possible. Well, you guys are the experts at assessing their family situation, social support, financial issues, and how are they coping with all of the changes that kidney failure brings? And what are their goals? It can be really challenging to bring up kidney transplant when they are just trying to get through today. And now we're gonna go to those poll results. And it looks like, oh good, the best one is never. No one answered never. So um, mostly it's with the care plan, 84%. And uh, a few when the patient asked or it's posted. So thank you for that feedback. So what exactly is the information that patients should be provided about transplant? Is there a structured outline of what should be discussed? Is once a year enough? If they say no, is the conversation done until the next year? If this requirement falls under the responsibility of the social worker, um, what about the rest of the team? And let's see. Um, oh, we already did our poll results. Sorry, I'm on a sequence. So anyway, I think it. I think it shouldn't be just one person's responsibility. I think it really is a team effort. Um, even though you may be the as the social worker, the primary person that's doing the documentation and taking the initiative. So maybe the default should be 
Everyone deserves a living donor transplant. Let's find a way to get you one. Um, would it be best for the patient if it wasn't the dialysis staff that decided who was a good candidate? That maybe patients are referred within the first couple of months of starting dialysis to the transplant team. And are the transplant centers communicating why they're not a good candidate and then what it would take to help them be a good candidate? And then could we set goals based on those changes that were needed to become a good candidate? And would it be best if goals were reevaluated monthly? And maybe some of you are doing that. So these are just things to consider. Um, what could be best for the patient. But you might also be thinking about these concerns. There's not enough time or staff or kidneys. So why bother referring? And aren't transplant centers already too busy? Well, I think if we increase the supply that the systems will grow and change to meet the demand. That's how we get new innovations. And that's why technology um, is always changing and making things hopefully, hopefully better for us. Um, I also work in a cancer center and I'll tell you what, no one says to cancer patients, there are too many people, <clears throat> excuse me, getting radiation. We can't refer you, refer you to the radiation doctor. Um, that would be crazy, right? <clears throat> But I feel like sometimes we do say, oh, the transplant center is too busy. We're not going to, you know, overburden them with more patients. So what would patient-focused care look like? The best treatment discussions would not depend on how busy the transplant centers are or how long the waiting list is. It would look more like we will help you get the best treatment, a living donor transplant. I remember when I was doing um, options with patients about hemo, PD, and transplant, I think back then we were overly concerned about choice and making sure all of these were equal options. And, and I think some of that has carried over through the years, even though we know they're not equal anymore. We have the data that shows they're not. Um, I honestly didn't know a living donor transplant was the best until I heard my husband's nephrologist talking about it. And I remember thinking, why don't I know that? Why am I not talking to patients about that? And maybe it was because the research had just, you know, been newer and we, we were just finding out. Um, and then there's another part of me, to be really honest with you, that thinks, I think at the time, it almost seemed like a white privilege secret. So today we have the data to show we have racial disparities and it's time to change our script for all patients. So the best treatment for most patients, do you hear this uh, recording that I, I can't stop saying? For most patients with kidney failure, it's a living donor transplant. Do you and your staff have enough information about kidney transplant, about living donation? Could there be unconscious biases against discussing living donation? We don't have symptoms, I'm sorry, systems in place to support living donation like we do deceased donation. Um, it's not really the responsibility of the transplant center or the organ procurement organizations, or the dialysis units. It, it's no one's responsibility. There is no living donor system. It's up to the patient to find their best treatment. So what could education ideas look like? Um, you know, introducing the idea that a living donor transplant gives you the best outcomes. Um, and, Acknowledge they might have some resistance. Um, 
And the goal is to help them fully understand all the implications, maybe before making a decision. Um, you know, maybe don't rush to a yes or no so that you can check the box. Really explore the issues related to transplant. Um, the benefits of living donor over deceased, the ways kidneys can be donated, the risk and benefits to donors, and resources to help find a living donor. And maybe have some family meetings discussing transplant. I know it's a lot. And that's why we have four sessions for you. We want to help you with the tools and information to make all of these conversations a little easier. So let's move this discussion to the kidney crisis for a minute. Because I think this background information is really important for you to understand. So on the transplant waiting list, only one in four will get a kidney and the rest will die waiting. If we look at the reality, we're providing the worst treatment for the most number of people, dialysis. And the best treatment is very limited, those that get a kidney transplant. Over 90,000 people are on the kidney transplant waiting list. And so let's look at the breakdown. Here's the 90,000 for kidney. And of those only, and this was in 2021, only 24,000, over 24,000 actually got a kidney. And this takes us to our next polling question, number three. So here we have a two-part question. The first is, are you registered to be an organ donor at death? And then number two, if you answered yes to the first question, do you believe you will donate when you die? So what is our solution for not enough kidneys? Um, register to be an organ donor, right? So in the United States, about 60% of the population are registered. And the most interesting statistic that I have found out in the last five years um, since having this nonprofit is less than 1% of those registered will ever donate. That was just astounding to me. But if you look at why, it kind of makes sense. So why won't we do you donate at death? Well, number one, the body in general needs to be healthy and the organs obviously need to be healthy. It doesn't matter if you're taking kidneys or heart or lungs, they need to be in good condition. The way you die is critically important. Uh, you will be on a ventilator in an intensive care unit and brain dead. I personally actually don't even know anyone in my family or friends that have donated in that way. Yes, I've heard of people that have that have died in that way, but no one personally in my life has that happened. So it's very rare. And the family must consent. Now I know legally you can take the organs, but hospitals aren't gonna stand in front of a family member who's like, no, I don't want you taking those organs. And they're not gonna take them. They don't want a lawsuit. They don't want any issues. If the family disagrees, they will not proceed typically with the donation. Um, so you can see how maybe, yeah, the reality is very few people will end up donating because they're not dying in the right way. And let's go to our polling results. Thank you. So it looks like about, oh, you're over the, the average. 84% of you are registered organ donors. And, and don't get me wrong, I am not saying don't be a registered organ donor. I totally believe it's extremely important, especially for the other uh, organs that we need. And then do you think you will donate when you die? About 84%, the same number. And I was exactly in the same boat. I thought absolutely it was the done deal. 
And that's really what I hear people tell me is they'll come up and say, yeah, I donated. And I'm like, what did you donate? And they're like, well, you know, I'm registered. And I'm like, well, that's really great. But registering doesn't mean you're an organ donor. And I think most of the U.S. population actually believes that, that that's true. In and in 99% of the cases, it will not be true. So what if we were an opt-out country where you had to opt out um, in order not to donate? So there's a really good comprehensive study that was done between the opt-in and the opt-out countries. And what they found is there were fewer living donors in the opt-in, or I'm sorry, in the opt-out countries. So you have to opt out if you do not want to donate and no difference in deceased donors. Um, the article talked about, you know, really needing to address other barriers uh, regarding organ donation, um, even when consent is presumed. So when I looked into the information about fewer living donors, I'm like, why is that? Well, if you think everyone's going to donate their organs, you probably don't think there's a problem. You probably think you're getting enough organs because you have to opt out if you don't want to donate. So they actually had fewer living donors. And again, I was just really surprised, no significant di difference in deceased donors. So it didn't make a difference. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, right? So let me show you this next slide. So I was so curious. I'm like, I wonder what that looks like, all the registered donors compared to the number of actual transplants. And I was astounded when I saw what this looked like. Um, so my question to you is, these are the over 19,000 people that got a kidney transplant. You can't even see, it doesn't even show up on the graph. It's so tiny in comparison to the 170 million people that are registered organ donors. And do you think getting more of these is gonna make a dramatic difference in this? Like more isn't solving the problem. So where are we gonna get our kidneys? Um, and didn't we get more deceased donor transplants in the last few years? And absolutely we did. So let's look at that. This is the line of the increase in deceased donor transplants. And this is the living donor transplants. We've been pretty stable at around 6,000 living donors for many, many years, has not changed. But the deceased went up. So you might think, oh, yay, that's such a great thing, right? Well, the sad thing, this is the OPTN annual report, is even though we saw this increase, it was from anoxia specifically and probably due to the opioid epidemic. So it wasn't because we did great PR and people more, more people registered. It was because more people died of overdoses. So... You know, as a society, wouldn't it be nice if we could get a handle on those opioid overdoses and saw these numbers go down, right? That would be like a win for society, but then we would have less transplants for people with kidney failure. So that's a problem, right? It's, it's just this very strange mix of good and not so good when people are dying and people are getting deceased donor transplants. So what other options do we have? Well, first I wanna just go through a little bit about my very basic idea of dialysis and transplant. So dialysis is okay. You live about five to 10 years, but even better good is a deceased donor kidney lasts about eight to 12 years. And then the best is preemptive, getting a kidney before you start dialysis and a living donor kidney, uh, about twice as long as a deceased donor and there's less wait time typically. 
And then you get other improvements like better quality of life, more free time, more stable blood pressure and electrolyte levels, and higher rates of employment. But besides health, there could be other considerations. So what's the cost of dialysis? Well, it costs Medicare about $121,000 per patient per year. And that's Medicare's us, you know, the taxpayers. Transplant, on the other hand, does cost more the first year, about $145,000, but then each year after that, only $32,000 because of the, the medications. So if you compare that over time, it's dramatically less expensive for society, for a Medicare, um, for insurance companies to get someone transplanted. The UK estimated that hemo patients have about more than a seven fold patient carbon footprint. And think about it, you walk into a dialysis unit and the water that's being used, the electricity, the plastic and cardboard waste. And I don't know um, what kind of recycling is being done um, in your dialysis units, if any. Um, and transportation, and this is transportation of patients to and from dialysis, and it's also transportation of staff to and from dialysis. And you just don't need all of those resources when you have a kidney transplant. So where do we find more kidneys? Back to that question. Well, organ discards, we would be great if we had less of those, no argument there. I'm not gonna go into detail about that. You've heard enough of that in the news. Um, deceased donors, we've kind of already talked about that. Yeah, you know, is it a good thing, a not good thing? <laughs> Depends on your perspective. Artificial kidneys, yes. There is lots of research being done on artificial kidneys. It'll be here someday. When, I don't know how much, you know, will it take the FDA to approve these, get through all the human, human trials, we'll see. And the same uh, with the genetically modified pig kidneys, it's happening also. It will be the future someday. How long will it take? I don't know. So, and, and I also wonder, will everyone be good candidates for the artificial and, and pig kidneys? You know, that's another thing is um, who, who will be able to get these? So that brings me back again to living donors. We we really could do something to help discover more living donors now. Um, what we're doing now isn't working. You know, we have been sitting at that 6,000 living donors a year for a long time. Um, there are some other things with better matching that's being done, and I'm hoping to talk about those in another session. Um, if you've never heard of Eplets, there's some really interesting information about um, high-resolution HLA tissue typing. Again, I'll try and get to that later. Um, there also is some groups that are trying to modify NODA so that there could be some benefits, additional benefits given to kidney donors. And would that make a difference? So I'll go into that in more detail another time. But really, my vision is that the worst treatment dialysis has the fewest number of people and that more people get kidney transplants and that maybe for right now we have living kidney donors filling that gap. Our next polling question is related to this kidney donation continuum that we put together. So I'm gonna go through it really quickly with you. Um, we want to help you through this um, these sessions to make you more comfortable with the idea of living donation. And so which currently describes your attitude toward donating uh, being an organ donor? Um, one would be never, um, not able to give, maybe some health reasons, only if you're dead, deceased donor. You might give to a specific person, maybe a family or friend, maybe an acquaintance, a stranger. You'd like to start the workup, 
or you're already a living donor. I'm really curious if we have any other living donors in, uh, in the audience. Um, and it might be helpful to just do this self-reflection about your own feelings. And can you have empathy for those that might have a little different perspective than you? Um, I think we might be able to go, if that poll's done, I might have um, you go ahead and do that. If not, I can move on. Oh, she's got it. Right. Let me go back. All right, so most people, and this is probably very typical of the general population, would only give to a family or friend. And 4% might consider a stranger or an acquaintance is kind of like a stranger too. And there's always a, a fair number of people that aren't that cannot donate for some reason and deceased. Great. That's very interesting. Thank you. So most often people make decisions about not wanting a kidney transplant or a living donor transplant based on fear. Um, here are some questions you could ask patients to find out their understanding and view on transplants. And hopefully the answers they give you can guide your education. So what have you been told about transplants? What concerns do you have? Uh, what have you been told about deceased donors? The waiting list, the wait time, the benefits of transplant compared to dialysis. And then what have you been told about living donor transplants, the benefits compared to deceased and the wait time. So I'm going to turn this back over to Elizabeth. Um, we hopefully have had some questions come up from the audience, but Elizabeth, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Glenna. <clears throat> Before we take questions, I did want to mention that in addition to the slides and the recording um, being posted on the Network 5 webpage, we're also going to have an additional flyer that's entitled Four Steps to Creating a Pro-Transplant Culture. This flyer will give you a framework for how to start that process of a pro-transplant culture within your facility. Um, and so now we can take questions. Um, as a reminder, please submit them in the Q&A section, which is right next to the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, I also wanted to note that we did receive a few questions during registration, and we have made note of those, and we are just rolling them over into subsequent sessions when um, the material aligns more with that presentation. Okay, so we have one question, Glenna. Um, do you have any tips on how to create a system of regular communication with transplant centers? So um, I don't know all of what your communication looks like now. So I want to preface, preface it with, with that. But as I was contemplating this, uh, two things kind of came to mind. One, do you, do the social workers have some kind of a spreadsheet or how do you keep track of your patients and where they are in the transplant process or maybe what education has been done or what their understanding is or were they referred are you waiting back so you know how do you keep track and would there would some kind of a spreadsheet be um kind of a good idea for helping with tracking just internally for you and then i think um regarding communicating with the transplant centers, I was wondering if there would be any kind of a pre-formatted uh, form that maybe had some checkbox. So whatever your most common questions or information you needed from them, could you send it? And then they could easily make check marks or a few notes and send it back to you. 
um, so that you had more of an ongoing communication. And, and is that something that would be helpful um, and something that could be used across all transplant centers, across all social workers? Um, so some kind of a template. And again, I don't know the detail of, do you communicate by email, by fax, you know, what's the electronic you know, methodology. So how do we make it easier? And I thought, well, you know, maybe Quality Insights might be interested in maybe coordinating or collaborating together to have some social workers and a transplant coordinator work together on how we could communicate better um, as kind of an equality improvement communication tool. I think that's a great idea. Um, next question is, Hypertension is prevalent in the African American community. Is a person with hypertension able to be a living donor? So typically, and and I always say typically because every transplant center has their own criteria, but typically they are allowed to be managed on one or two blood pressure medications and can still be considered a kidney donor. So you know, the key word being, are they managed in, into a normal blood pressure range with one or two medications? So often they can, yeah. Next question. I have a couple of patients who are active on the transplant lists. They have young adult children who want to be living donors, but the patients themselves do not want to take kidneys from their children. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly why I, we're doing these four series is because I think there needs to be a lot more education about the risk for donors. I think it's very fear-based when I ha hear people say, I don't want them because. Um, and so I would like your feedback at the end of the series to say, do you think we gave you more information to help you have better discussions with patients? You know, what are they afraid of? What um, What's their biggest fear? And sometimes it's not always valid. Like when you look at the actual data, and I'll be sharing that, especially in the next two presentations, we'll focus much more on the risk and the process for living donors. So I'm not going to go into the detail now, um, but if you come back for, for those next two sessions, I think you'll get more information. And that's what we want you to share with families. And, and would it be helpful to have, you know, again, a, a family conference, you know, get the family in the room together with the potential donors, ask the questions, answer, you know, give them answers that everyone can hear in the same room. Um, and will that help break down some of these barriers? Because for the person who wants to donate, they feel like that person is important enough to keep alive longer in their life. And isn't, isn't that a good reason also to donate a kidney because you love someone and maybe you want them to be a part of your family longer or you want your children, you know, to have time with them. So sometimes I think it's it's like, no, I don't deserve it, or no, I don't wanna put them at risk without really knowing you know, all the information about living donation and all the options of living donation. Um, next question. One of my transplant centers has a guide to finding a living donor. How do you feel about that as a resource for patients? So it's a guide for how to find a living donor. It sounds that way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't know, is this published probably by the Transplant Center? But yeah, absolutely. In the last session, number four, we're going to talk about what are the resources for helping a donor find you, you know, the person who needs the kidney. And so, yes, I think um, those resources, and if, you know, if, if that's something you could share even with um, the network, that would be really interesting to see what's out there, um, if that's a possibility. 
I'll be giving you resources and websites and people that have more information about helping to find a donor. So I think everyone will get, you know, a few more supportive tools as we go along. But yeah, absolutely. Um, this is an, an interesting one. Um, has there been any research on the spirituality of receiving a kidney or other organ donation? I know hospitals provide spiritual support, but curious if transplant centers encourage or provide spiritual support as well. That's probably a better question for those of you in the diagnosis units. Um, so I know, um, yeah, I, I keep thinking from a from a donor perspective, most religions allow people to donate. Um, and I don't think that's really the question you're asking. I think you're asking, what is the support? And I would say the social workers, you as the social workers would probably know best in your communities where that support is. And, I, you know, are you looking at a faith based um, patient <clears throat> um, or just general support. I know in the hospitals, we used to have a lot more chaplains and people coming in. And I think a lot of that went away with COVID. And so I really don't know. And I don't know that we've ever had that for dialysis units though, in general. Um, so that's, I think a good question. And I would, you know, if you feel like that's something we want to explore in more detail, that could be, you know, another discussion. Uh, the next question I, is one I can take um, that was asking about, does anyone have a list or spreadsheet of transplant center criteria? Um, <laughs> and it looks like that's been somewhat addressed in the chat, but just to, to put it out there, yes, every transplant center has a little bit of variation. So certainly you can contact the transplant centers directly, but also um, the networks generally post the criteria on their websites as well. So you can check there and we will have a chart that would link you to the referral criteria. Um, for those. So I, Elizabeth, I have a question, follow-up question for you. Yes. Is that public information or do you have to be a trans, a dialysis okay. unit to view your network spreadsheet that has that criteria? We have it, do you mean in terms of who can view it from the website? Yes. Um, it, anyone can do that from our website. Okay, that's good to know because we've not had a, we, we there is no single resource to look at transplant centers, but that's interesting that you're saying each network has the transplant center criteria or just yours? Uh, I cannot speak for other networks, but I can say that uh, network five does, and I believe three and four is as well. Yeah, Glenna, um, this is Brandy, um, the executive director for Network 5. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just to chime in here on this topic, most ESRD networks do have this information posted in, in one centralized location on their websites that anyone can access. Um, I will tell you that even in our own network, we have had a hard time getting the criteria from some transplant center. So I would love to say that, you know, it's 100% out there. And even recently I have gone on transplant center websites looking for the information so that we can update and I can't find it. So um, we certainly try to provide as much of the information as we can in one sense for lots of location. Thank you, because I think there is a lack of transparency, as you've just mentioned, with the transplant centers, and it's very frustrating from a donor perspective and someone who's looking for a kidney to know because there is the variation across centers. So thank you for for trying to you know make that better. And I will definitely share that in my circles that the networks are a good resource for that. Thank you. Um, okay, 
question, will patients need to go through the same evaluation processes and testing if they receive a living kidney donation? Yeah, typically the testing, I mean, the testing this is done is, is the same. If you're a if you're healthy enough to get a kidney transplant, it doesn't matter what kind of kidney you get. So what the normal pro progression for most people who go through workup, who want a kidney, is they're active on the deceased donor uh, waiting list first, only because often they don't have a living donor already ready to go. So, and, a, and some centers won't work up a donor until you're active on the transplant waiting list. Mm. And it, again, it depends on the donor uh, or the transplant center. Sometimes they will work up a donor while the recipient is going through their workup also. So again, it just, it's very center specific, but the workup is the same for the person who needs the kidney. Um, this is the last question what I see for right now. Um, how would you suggest talking to patients who have had a friend or family member who had a bad experience with transplant, um, a failure, a traumatic surgery, something like that? Uh, and I will say we we hear this um, often. Um, mm -hmm. There are little fish bowls in trans or in dialysis, and so you know one bad experience really has a ripple effect for. Mm -hmm or other patients in the unit. So I'm gonna share a personal story with you related to that issue. Um, my, my husband has polycystic kidney disease and his grandmother, uh, father and uncle, his siblings all have PKD and have been on dialysis and have gotten transplants. His uh, father died within months of getting his kidney transplant. Um, and so that was really a negative issue for my husband. His uncle died after getting a kidney transplant also. So what I he was like totally fearful of going on the transplant. It's like, no, I don't want a transplant. I am gonna die if I get one because look at my family history. And I said, okay, fine, but let's look at why they died. Uh, number one, his father had heart failure. He did not die from any complications related to the transplant at all. He had a failing heart. He had been a, a recovered alcoholic. He, you know, he didn't have good vascular system and he didn't do well uh, because of his heart failure, not because of his transplant. His uncle, his kidney was working fine also he had a percutaneous biopsy done of the kidney and they nicked the peritoneum and he had a peritonitis infection that they didn't discover for a long time afterwards. Um, so there are very specific reasons why people don't do well after they get a transplant. And so it depends on what that situation is. And then the person who now is looking for a transplant or potentially considering it, what's their health situation? How is it different or better? And I said to my husband, I'm like, you walk several times a week. You're healthier. You don't have all the issues your, your father had. And you probably will do very well with a kidney transplant. There's nothing to indicate you wouldn't do well. So I would just please look at the person in front of you and what is their health condition? What are their risk factors? And you can't compare apples and oranges because they're not the same people and it's not the same day and age. And we have uh, better things that we can do with people to help the kidneys last longer than we did, you know, 20 years ago. So, so please have, an open mind and look at the individual rather than allowing them to just make these blanket statements because of all the people they know that have that have died for some reason. You know, did they have a deceased donor transplant? Did they have a living donor transplant? You know, what was what was the match? What are the other health risk factors? There's just so many things to consider. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, if you will 
will advance the slides a oh, yes. little bit more. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for letting me be here, for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm really excited that I think as we go through these four sessions, um, you will continue to hopefully to learn and to get some tools and and to take back information to your dialysis units, to your patients, to your other staff, uh, to help you have really better conversations, um, to help people. You know, I always say, because living donor transplants, the best treatment, isn't that what we want for every patient? The very best treatment, the longest life. And so how do we help them with that? How do we help them step through that process in a supportive way? So thank you very much. We would, we thank you all for joining. We would appreciate your feedback on today's education session. Um, you can use the link that we are going to post in the chat and that will take you to the evaluation. Um, you can also use the QR code here. Um, you're also going to receive an email following this webinar that will include the links. Uh, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, this course is approved by ASWB for social work continuing education credits, but you must complete and submit both the evaluation and the post-knowledge check. Your official certificate will be emailed to you within three business days. Let's make sure we get that. Survey Monkey link in the chat. Um, and while we are waiting on that, <clears throat> um, just a thank you for joining us. And if you have not already done so, please register and join us for session two which is called The Pathway to Giving, Understanding the Living Kidney Donor Process. This is gonna be held on November 1st, which is a Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we should also have the registration link for that in the chat. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. <laughs>